How important is a clearly defined purpose in the growth of brands, organizations, agencies, and people? The co-founder and Group Chief Creative Officer of Joe Public, Pepe Mare, who was recently inducted into the Lewis Hall of Fame, shares his experiences on defining and translating purpose in business, life, and society. He's also the author of two remarkable books titled Growing Greatness and 20 Habits That Break Habits. We discuss how defining and living their purpose led to the growth of Joe Public, saving the business and helping them to build what's one of Africa's most revered independent agencies. If, you, if you're interested in building a profound sustainable business, it has to start on the foundation of defining what is the greater purpose of this business beyond its profit and beyond its product. How can a clear purpose help to alter brand thinking and create a positive change in society? If, it's, if there's not a clearly communicated core to the business that becomes the heart of the business, how do you ever create sustainability? And I think that's why so many brands fail <clears throat> globally. We discuss how well we are doing in exporting creative work and advertising to positively change the world's view on Africa. So my intervention that happened at the low point of my life where, where I discovered this insight of purpose for, for my personal life, I implemented it very rigorously as a strategy for my life and I saw a significant change within two years, like significant. This is The Lead Creative. Welcome to The Lead Creative Podcast, where we talk to creative industry leaders, influencers and brands. We discuss the strategies that influence brand thinking and shape industries. Thought leaders and heads of agencies let us in on some of their thinking and insights. I'm your host, Mongi Simtati. Enjoy the show and please share and subscribe. Pepe, thank you so much for making the time to, to chat with us. I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. How are you doing? I'm good, Mungesi. Thank you. How are awesome, you doing, awesome. by the way? I should be reciprocal. No, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you. Yeah, I'm doing good. Um, and before we start, congratulations on being inducted into the Louis Hall of Fame. That's a major, major milestone. And I saw that, you know, a lot of media came up as a result of that. How have things been for you since that, uh, since that milestone? Yeah, I suppose it's, it's not something I've, I've always aspired from day one of, of even in my career pre our company, I wanted to be the best for whatever reasons. There's some, there's some unconscious reasons for that. I always strive to be the best I can be. Um, albeit, the reasons weren't always good, if I think back now. Um, so I was I was honored, but I was very conscious also that it feels that I'm halfway through my career. You know, so I, I would always have thought a Hall of Fame is what you get just before you finally finish your career. Um, but I was still, I was very honored. And I was also very aware that, that it was an achievement by my own efforts, but also by the grace of the efforts of a massive amount of people around me. You know, that's not an award that comes, I don't think it's like being a runner and winning an Olympic gold where you can go, okay, that's probably the runner and a coach and, and a few people along the way. This is a, an award, it's almost a privilege because it, it comes through the efforts of so many people. But yeah, I, was, I'm, I'm, I still remain, it, it was good for my ego, the bit of ego mm. I still got. Absolutely. I think, I mean, I think you are, only just getting started. I think it's it's one of those things um, that acknowledges the work that you've done, and of course the everything else that that the industry believes you still will contribute. In your book, Growing Greatness, you talk about how imaginative you were as a kid. There's a there's a part where you describe how you describe your dad as this 007 Bond character, um, and and with all these cool gadgets. So was there a time in your life when you realized that some things drew you to the creative industry or were you always, did you always know that you'd end up here? Not at all. Not at all. That, that little bit of, of imagining my father as a hero was almost my, my way of dealing with the fact that he was not. You know, like as, as men... You know, we love our mothers, but, but we need role models. And when your father figure is such a, 
by perception and, and in reality, such a terrible role model. It was almost my way of, of creating the hero that he wasn't. You know, and, and it, it, it got me into some trouble because I made up such, I fabricated such incredible stories about him being a spy, which I, which I sold onto my friends as absolute truth, which actually made me a liar. And you could say, well, that's perfect for going into advertising. <laughs> the lies that we sell consumers, some people may believe, which is also not true, not always true. But at that stage, not at all. That was just a young kid dealing dealing with with his role model, not not quite being what I would have loved my dad to be, and then pretending that he was something he wasn't. I had no ambition. I mean, even even my artistic flair, I only discovered post going to the National Defence Force. So I, I was not aware that I had this innate creative talent. I had music in me, for sure. I played piano as a young kid, which I stopped as well, because my my friends teased me, because piano was seen to be for girls, you know, the, the things kids do to each other, all of us. Um, so my ambition was to become a civil engineer. <laughs> so that was my big, big play. And, and the only reason I wanted to become a civil engineer is because I wanted to make money. There was, I was just, I just wanted to make money. That, and, I, and I saw a friend of mine's dad was rich and he was an engineer. And I put two and two together and said, well, I want to be rich. I want to be an engineer. And I see that in township schools, which I work with today. Parents want their children to become doctors, lawyers, engineers. And the drive for that is we're striving to make money. And in the end... I don't know if that's the right approach. Absolutely, absolutely. When I met you for the first time in 2010 through someone in your team, you were at the time, and you still are to a point, working um, through Rock for AIDS, one school at a time, and I think you were preparing to climb Kilimanjaro where the proceeds would then go to one school at a time. Um, And I found that to be something at least for me in 2010 at the time, even now, to be something that takes creativity and uses the creative industry for good, to change society for the better. What do you believe about uh, the creative industry's role in making society a better place? That's such a loaded question. That's, that is something that I'm currently trying to figure out. Because... The industry at a global level do a lot of projects that at perception, like at face value, looks like the industry is doing good. And I'll, I'll, have to th- I'll have to make an assumption around it. I would assume maybe five in 100 of those campaigns really do do good, like make a real impact. And potentially 95 out of 100 are created just to create fame for the agencies. And we've done that ourselves. You know, we've, we've, we've created work for nonprofit organizations that's outstanding, but that doesn't have the media spend or the communication, because the real spend in communication is, at, is the media. So it's a small-scale piece that doesn't have the reach to make a difference to the, to the, to the brand that you're trying to serve. And... In essence, you end up actually serving your own creative um, profile as an agency more than the nonprofit. So that's something we've done ourselves and something that doesn't sit comfortable with me. And it is something that I would say exists within our industry at a global level. What we are driving more and more to, if I take one school at a time, one school at a time, we hardly do anything that wins awards. Um, we actively work with two township schools and we actively work towards making those environments better for the people. Now and again, we'll do a creative project around it and um, that at times have had massive results. I mean, I've once, we did a, we did a piece of work called Project English. When I showed that at a board meeting to a funder, they gave us 600,000 Rand. It was emotionally so impactful. So that piece of work got, got the right response. 
piece of creativity that did end up winning a lot of awards, but I used it as a tool emotionally to unlock capital to run our, our endeavor. What I'm actively now pursuing is, is to really more and more, wherever there's an opportunity, use creativity to make things better. You know, whether that's to create just a more lighter, you know, just to make people laugh sometimes in this world we live in is, is a good thing. So there's a, there's a journey. I think this, this journey of growth is never ending. I might do something yesterday one way and today wake up with a new consciousness and, and change my view. So right now, there was a time when I played the game myself where I did um, pieces of work for non-profit in order to win awards and it left me feeling empty. But then at the same time, we created Brothers for Life, you know, one of the most significant campaigns in terms of dealing with HIV AIDS and, and, and the behavior of men over the age of 30, that was a significant campaign where we use creativity for good. So, so yeah, I think it's all about balance, you know, the good and the bad. Absolutely. There are two things that I'm getting um, out of that. Uh, the first is I think the role of creativity in magnifying the good that you're doing, which is, I'm guessing what led to the 600,000 Rand donation that you got from a funder. And the other one is something that you talk a lot about, and I want to unpack this a little bit more, um, this idea of purpose, that the purpose must be pure and the purpose must be communicated. You speak mm -hmm. a lot on purpose mm -hmm. as a result. Um, in the work that I've followed you around and also just the conversations that you have, you talk a lot about purpose. What is the value of purpose in building an independent agency and a brand as you have with Joe Public? So purpose is a concept that came into my life in 2007. And I can absolutely state with my hand on my heart that it fundamentally shifted my life into a in, totally another dimension. And on a personal life level, it's it's easier when you work with yourself. Well, it's actually it's not that much easier, but it is. It's still it's still more doable because the, the the thing about purpose. There's one thing to talk purpose. It's a completely different thing to walk purpose. You you see that in all walks of life. It's very easy to talk about stuff and to talk about the problems and to point finger and to blame and all it's a complete different story to actually get down and dirty and make a difference even in terms of business to start a business build a business create 300 jobs go through bankruptcy rebuild it it's a complete another journey you know so of course there's a lot of talk around purpose it's become a massive global talking point it's completely accepted in all boardrooms now that C-suite's talking purpose. There's not a lot of walking purpose at all. So my intervention that happened at the low point of my life where, where I discovered this insight of purpose for, for my personal life, I implemented it very rigorously as a strategy for my life and I saw a significant change within two years, like significant. And I then started really thinking about you know, if this is a difference it can make to a human being, what can this do for a business being? Because ultimately a business is a being too, in my book. And I, by the grace of my partners, were allowed to bring this thinking into our business. And we started in 2009, we, we hit the brick wall. We were pretty much technically insolvent. And, and we rebuilt our business on purpose. Defining the purpose in one word, what's the word at the core of the business, which one will be, you'll assume it's creativity, it turned out it's not. And then defining what that word means and then making that our strategy. But what's interesting is a decade later, I would say, again with my hand on my heart, that it's made a significant contribution to our business and to the sustainability of our business and the performance of our business and the output of our business 
and the way our business run. But I would still say a decade later, we are probably delivering not more than 30% on our purpose. So this journey of, of having purpose is a constant sort of journey of growth because all it means is you become conscious of why you're in this world and then you need to figure out how do you deliver on this new knowledge. And that delivery is extremely tough. Hmm. And as you grow as, as an organization, as a person, um, you become less hands-on in the business as well as in this, you know, this centeredness around purpose. How then, as you become less hands-on, do you translate this purpose and your reason for being so that as you evolve, the legacy of the business around its purpose lives on? Well, this, this is actually, this I think is the biggest, the biggest benefit of purpose is sustainability. Because, and specifically, if I start as a founder of a business, and let's say I be, uh, if I'm blessed, I'll stay with this business potentially another 15, 20 years. But when you build a business to live beyond 100 years, you can't build it in the absence of purpose. Because what spirit do you leave behind when you leave yourself? If, it's, if there's not a clearly communicated core to the business the, that becomes the heart of the business, how do you ever create sustainability? And I think that's why so many brands fail <clears throat> globally. You know, um, Jim Collins did that study, Good to Great Book, and he, he did a, he, a significant amount of companies he looked at. He found 11 of them to be the greats back in those days, two decades ago. I don't think any of them exist, not exist, but none of them are top businesses anymore. Um, if I look at the United States, I think the average lifespan of business 50 years ago was something like 60 years on average. It's dropped down to 18, 16 to 18 years is the average lifespan of a business. So something is significantly wrong with our approach to business because the normal approach to business, especially when businesses are corporatized, it becomes about the bottom line. It becomes about revenue, market share, growth, financial growth, numbers, which is nothing to do with the soul of business. And hence, that business, businesses aren't sustainable. So to, for me, if, you, if you're interested in building a profound, sustainable business, it has to start on the foundation of defining what is the greater purpose of this business beyond its profit and beyond its product. And I think that's what we're busy, this is what we're busy designing and, 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 and building into the core of our business. How do brands integrate it effectively into their messaging, this, this concept and idea of purpose? Um, I mean, there are some brands that when you look at, have a clearly, or at least you, receive, you, you get a clearly defined purpose in them when you look at them and, and how they feel. And these are, you know, commonly cited brands like Nike and Apple and all the rest of it. Um, I would say probably in the South African, um, in the, in the South Africa, it would be Nando's, whom, of course, um, you know, uh, at least live up to it. So, how do brands communicate it effectively beyond the the, you know, beyond just talking about it, beyond being as you've just mentioned now with 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 nonprofits just doing it to save face and to you know spend budget and communicate a purpose that isn't real for them how do they communicate it and integrate it into their into their lifespan or into their day to day yeah. i you know it's like anything change doesn't happen overnight <clears throat> there is definitely a shift people want to be more purposeful but they don't understand purpose. It's not clear. And what I'm finding is if you bring purpose into a big organization, but in your personal life, you, you're not really purpose-driven and you don't completely have clarity on what it really means, I think you're going to struggle to implement it, whether that's within your business or through your marketing campaigns. So if I look at the globe, so you mentioned Nike. 
I mean, Steve Jobs was very clear. It was, it's quite interesting. His, his personal mission statement, which could be related to purpose. You know, this idea of making a dent in the universe, this idea of creating a tool that can advance humanity. That's massive. You know, it was very much in service of something much bigger than money. And he created one of the most wealthiest companies in the world. Whether he left enough depth and enough clarity around what is the true purpose of Apple is going to be questionable because there's a lot of talk around Apple and the way they're behaving and all the little extra gadgets that cost consumers money, you know, um, by the fact that Tim Cook is not very good at wagging a, a, a Formula One flag, but, but Tim Cook's done a great job. I'm not yet to, I mean, I look at that level of person and he worked for Steve but I don't, and who am I to point finger at that magnificent business of whom I'm actually a fan of the brand? But I would say that for me, it's very difficult to entrench purpose in a business if the leadership is not conscious of their own personal purpose or what does this concept of purpose mean? So I think it's going to be a many, many years of grappling and figuring out what does purpose mean? How do you behave? Can it really become a business, um, like a business imperative and a business strategy? I mean, there's so much proof that it benefits business, but there's not a lot of business that truly live their purposes. So I, I think it's very difficult to advertise purpose if you don't live purpose. Absolutely. In your view, how well are we doing in exporting our creative thinking, or at least our approach uh, to creative as a country and as a continent to the rest of the world? In advertising? It, yeah, let's say, let's start with advertising. I mean, I've, I've seen in, in, some, in some instances, I think we are. In fashion, we are. There are some brands that are representing us well, but also you see a lot of work across a lot of spaces within advertising, within creativity that that could either be inspiring or or change mm. the world view on Africa as a continent and what's and what we're able to do. Are yeah. we doing? Are we are we moving the needle where that's concerned? If if I just I, I wouldn't if I just go completely on my instinct and, and sort of my sense and experience, if I look at platforms that used to exist pre-COVID, like the Design in Daba, and you go to the Design in Daba in Cape Town, which was renowned as one of the best design shows in the on the planet, and you then go and engage, they used to have an exhibition of local designers. I mean, you just see the caliber of design in this country. It's insane. And and hence, you get international people coming to this country and going, this is one of the gems of the world. Whether we've done enough or that is a different sort of, um, sort of question to look at. But definitely, we, we have got, and you said in fashion, fashion, we definitely got the standouts that are making impact globally on, on a small scale. But the talent is here. The talent is in South Africa. The talent is in Africa. If I speak to advertising, the talent is absolutely here. You know, one of the one of the global leaders of advertising, David Droger, came to the design in Darbo a few years ago, and he reported back. He was already part of Accenture, and he reported back to Accenture and said, "We got to get, we got to get into Africa. We got to get into South Africa. It's the most creative country I've ever been to in my life." That's coming one of the world's creative leaders. Um. So it's here, but whether we are capitalizing on it and using it to the level that we should be using it and actually respecting it and revering it to the level that we should does not exist. It's, it's like hardly, you, you can just go, if I speak to advertising, I can safely say that 99% of all the creative communication out there does not add value to the media space that it occupies at all. And that to me, I'm sometimes dumbfounded that that's not a much bigger talking point because 80% of our clients' money goes into media spend. Only 20% goes to the agency's fees and the production. So how then can we occupy those spaces with such poor, average, creative campaigns? 
and I think that that's something that we need to start taking a lot seriously, a lot more seriously. We do as an agency. It's 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 a it sometimes feel like we're swimming against a tsunami because somehow the world has become occupied with busyness. So we'd rather keep ourselves busy with lots of small things, lots of small things, you know, things that live for 22 seconds that, that most consumers don't even see. And we put process behind that to create these little things that no one sees. And then we pat ourselves on the backs and we say we're so busy, but we're busy with nothing. We're making no significant difference. And if we can actually realize the impact we can make if we do less better, I mean, that's Apple's strategy. You make one phone per year or, you know, you create one magnificent product. So instead of doing 100 different things per year, why don't you do 10 and do those 10, 10 times more impactful? Because you're working with the same amount of time and energy. So 100, time, 100 things are going to say take you the same time. If you do 10 things, you can put all that time and do each thing 10 times better. You know, it's almost like the educational system. Do less subjects better. Create more confidence in, in, in people, you know, self-confidence. So, yeah, so we're obsessed with busyness, and, and, and it's something we really need to start to become conscious of. If you're enjoying The Lead Creative, please share this episode with your network and hit follow or subscribe. Enjoy the show. In times when uh, um, there were global players coming into the continent, coming into South Africa, acquiring agencies um, everywhere you looked, you, Joe Public remained fiercely independent. I could say that um, you 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 know you stood out from all the other agencies that got acquired at the time. What is it about growing African brands or about growing a fiercely independent brand that resonates with you? You know, if I look back, we we launched in nineteen ninety eight, and we had this incredibly creative concept called takeaway advertising. So at Joe Public, advertising for the man and woman on the street. That's why it was called Joe Public. We wanted to make work for the man and woman on the street. Probably back then we weren't as conscious. We would probably have just said for the man on the street. you know. But, but clearly it was intended for the man and woman on the street. And then we were approached by an international holding company. And we sold in 2001. So we weren't always independent, but we sold because we loved this concept so much and they proposed to us that they want to take this concept global. So for me, the thinking was, wow, if we could take a South African brand, a South African idea of takeaway advertising all over the world, how amazing. That never happened because we soon realized they were just buying our bottom line and they sold it on. So we belonged to a international holding company for eight years of my 24 years journey with Joe Public. So almost a third of the time, we belong to an international organization. And that's where I personally gained the insight that once you are owned by an international company, instead of your client being your mo most important person, second, second to your people, you know, our people first, but our client second. Without them, we don't have a business. So, so pre being bought by an international group, the client was the boss. The client was the person you keep happy. You know, like in a restaurant, your customer, that, that's your obsession. Once you're owned by a holding company, your holding company becomes your obsession because they want, they want the returns and your focus becomes money. And not the excellence of your product that you give the service to your client. And I think that's created this shift in our country and the shift away from, from doing great work. Although I see average work all over the world. So it might be like a global pandemic that might have a more severe impact than COVID because it's mediocrity is it's it's rife. And I saw that shift. So hence, when we bought ourselves back in 2009, we shifted the focus back to the value we offer our customers, our clients. And we realized the more value we create for our clients, the better work should mostly result in better sales. There's no way that, that average work 
can outpunch great work. You know, great strategically led creative solutions for brands has to logically and also factually it's it's measured and it's proven it outpunches average and we just started focusing on giving our clients that and and the byproduct of that then becomes money you know you you, you start tasting more success because you're offering value and i can i can apply that to so many different walks of life i mean you know you just you give more value even if you're a person working for another person you give more value in time, you're going to earn more because you're giving more value. But often people want to earn more for giving less. You mentioned that this happened around 2009. And, and, and earlier on, you mentioned that 2009 was also around the time when you um, were doubling down quite a lot on purpose. Um, are these, are these I'm, see, I'm seeing a connection uh, between these. Was there a connection? Yeah, there's definitely a connection. That and and you know, I'm so aware nowadays. Life is very special. We just don't see it. We we only see the bad. We don't see the magic in the bad. You know, we we only see the we don't see the good in the bad. Bad always inspires good. It's natural. A felt fire inspires growth. You know, you can look at anything. Anything in life. In the moment, you don't see it, but you look back at it, you realize a lot of significant things. Like, for instance, I fired a person for racism because I come from a racist background and I, I worked very hard to undo that conditioning for many years. And I became intoler intolerant of that kind of behavior. So I fired someone and that person went and worked for our biggest client and then three months later fired us. So we lost half our business overnight. In the moment, I actually spoke to someone last night about it. Retrenched 40 people. Worst day of my life, of my and my business partner at that stage, my and Gareth's life, lives. That must have been the worst day of our life. That was the moment when we realized the, the, by devalue, the business was then devalued for the first time we could afford to buy it back. So the worst thing inspired the opportunity to buy the business back. That is how life works. So, so yes, there's a connection, but, but it happened more naturally than, a, than almost a premeditated connection. Looking back, there's a connection. There was a connection between seeing, well, firstly, the purpose of the business is to grow our people, to grow our clients, and to grow our country. To be the fertile soil that serves the growth of our people, our clients, and our country then how we grow our people is through the greatness of our product. So, so the creative delivery and the output, the product of the business is actually the how. It's not the why. It's not why we exist. It is how we deliver why we exist. And it's how we grow our people. It's how we grow our clients. It's how we contribute to our taxes and jobs creation in this country and to one school at a time in the townships. Um, it's how we generate the capital that we use to add value to society and of course also to thrive as as founders of the business um, but not always with the intention of share, sharing more um, but it's definitely the purpose happened in 209 and then because the if if you want to grow people at a higher level even in our industry than most then we have to do better work than most because that will grow people more because that's what we do so the two are definitely linked. The starting point was the purpose, and then the, the return to creativity was, was mandated by the purpose. Mm -hmm. In your book, Growing Greatness, you talk about some intense uh, stories from your childhood. Looking back now, how do you think those helped to, I think, shape your outlook to, I suppose, the creative industry, to your wanting to build and grow, um, you know, a lot of the things that you've grown both in and outside the industry over the years? Yeah, shoof. <laughs> Every single person, you see, we always think only bad things happen. You know, like, like when we talk to childhood trauma, the word trauma makes you think of really bad things. 
but it can it can be quite traumatic just for a child to cry in their little crib and a parent doesn't come quick enough. That could be trauma. Um, so there's all these different levels of trauma that happens with all of us between the ages of naught and six, seven years. And those, because your, your unconscious brain, your conscious brain is only formed post six years of age, all those experiences goes into your unconscious. And your unconscious processes at 400 billion bits per second. And your conscious only at 2,000. So that's one gram versus two tons. I, I, I figured it, a friend of mine from Europe figured this out for me two weeks ago. It's, it's 150 characters, a tweet versus four hours and 10 minutes of HD footage. Your unconscious is four hours and 10 minutes, Lord of the Rings trilogy. Unconscious, your conscious brain is a tweet. So as a child, all these conditions go into this unconscious power of ours. And it sits in us as adults and it limits us. So my childhood trauma, which which can't even be, it must be minuscule compared to the majority of our country's trauma, you know, as a white privileged person. But I experienced violence and alcoholic rage and obsession with guns and trying to shoot people in front of me. I experienced a lot of things from the age of 0 to 14. And fundamentally, I think those experiences made me a much stronger human being today. There's still a lot of things that I struggle with. You know, I, I, I still, I still, so I, I still, I still can be very hard and ruthless and, and almost hurt people through my behavior because I'm conditioned with such a thick skin. You know, I can I can manage very confrontational um, debates and, and I can manage aggression and anger very well because, because as a child I endured so much of it. So, so aspects of it still plays out in my life, not to the best that I can be, but I'm conscious of it and that gives me something to work on. But, but in general... All those things actually have played out as a positive in my life. I'm more respectful of women um, because of it. I've become an entrepreneur because of it. You know, like it's given me resilience. It's, it's, it's driven me to achieve a lot more because, because I wanted to prove so much more. Because that role model that ended up pretty much dying of alcohol abuse and seeing that, and he was immensely talented, and seeing that talent wasted away, wanted me to, to, to prove that I won't be the same, which is also not always healthy, you know. It gave me such an in, immense drive to succeed, but it also got me to the point of discovering my purpose and then going, okay, hang on now. I, can, I can't do this on my own, just through my own sort of drive and fear of not wanting to be like my father. That got me to a certain level in life. But but when I started opening my mind to, to greater potential and, and greater service of more, I realized, you know, I put that almost behind me. There's, there's some aspects of it still remnants. And that it, it still, it excites me. It's not that I'm hard on myself. It really, it gives me room for growth. It's such a beautiful thing for me to become conscious of how much more we can be. So I make mistakes every single day of my life. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so far from perfect, but, but I'm not hard on myself. I'm gentle with myself, and I, I, I'm just I'm conscious of how much more we all can be as people. If you're enjoying The Lead Creative, please share this episode with your network and hit follow or subscribe. Enjoy the show. And that's uh, that, that, that's 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 great. I think that gives me an even better understanding of the book itself because that that description. I think this idea that it's not just the good things that happen to you; it's both it's uh, both the good and the bad that refine you, that help to that help you to become great, that help to grow that greatness. That yeah. of course the 
you know the book is 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 titled around. Yeah. Besides that, what is another or just the one takeaway that you want people to get from from growing greatness? Yeah, you know, I've spent now since two thousand eight. Um, I, I've I've spent a lot of time in in, in Deep Slut and Soweto. Um, and I'm I'm always so clear of of my privilege. I'm I'm not blind to that, you know. But I'm also conscious that I had a I had a very very interesting upbringing. I've got a very interesting back story and a back context. And my intention of my first book, I wrote that book for for black South Africans coming from poor poor backgrounds. I, that was my purest intention because I wanted to show people because of because I wanted to show people without taking away f- from what's been wrong in this country, I wanted to show people that those things that we judge as that we almost judge as shortcomings, they give us incredible depth. I'm not making it good. You know, I, I even sometimes when I just think about it, these are things I think about. I don't even know if it's sometimes appropriate what I say. And I try and be not to let everything just come out of my mouth that comes to mind. But if I look at John Smith as a Springbok captain, and I look at Siak Kolisi as a Springbok captain, you know, both got to the top. But the one starting point was here, and the other one starting point was down on the ground. So, so the, the level of growth that Siak Kulisa must have gone through to become the leader that he's become must position him to such a level of depth. You know, it actually puts him to, in an advantage. His disadvantage actually puts him in an advantage. And I'm not making light of disadvantage either. I'm just relating it to my experience where I started from relatively nothing and use those insights to my benefit rather than using them as a crutch. So, so, so I really believe each of us have got incredible potential irrespective of where we're born. Um, and, and if we can just see that, I think we can turn our country into something really special. Um, and it's going to take a long time and it's going to take a lot of us to do more work um, and to add more value and to get people's minds primed for that because it's very difficult with all the trauma that this country has been through just to expect people to wake up to that insight. Um, but but it's really my truth. You know, the worst things that I've experienced in my life has turned out to be the best things every single time mm. yeah. to this yeah. date, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then you 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 then went and um, I think in 2020 then released 20 habits that break habits and I feel like this is this is actually a great sequel to growing greatness because you understood where you were and you understood that there were habits that that you needed to break or form new habits and. Um, I, I sneakily stalk you on LinkedIn just to see some of the stuff that you post and one of the things that you talk about quite a lot as a habit that you've that that you are religious about is your exercise and your morning routine and 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 that how important is how important is that how important is that routine and building and forming habits that break past habits but also build new ones so and i, I must say because i've said a lot now that i didn't really think about so at this stage i need to say these are just seen through my lens and my experience. Doesn't make it right <laughs> or wrong. It's just opinion, you know. And then I don't really follow other people's opinions, but there's a lot of people that say stuff that influence my thinking and, and molds my thinking. So, so I just want to say at this stage, whatever I've said up to this point, these are just my views based on my experience, a lens through which I see the world as a white male. South African. Um, but so the habit insight, again, is just based on my life and what worked for me. It might not work for you. Some people might go, I'm not a morning person. Don't give me this nonsense. 
fundamentally the insight I wanted to share because I had some feedback. A lot of people loved it. I had some people that changed their habits, that changed their lives. I thought, well, that made it worthwhile. And then I had other people say to me, you were preaching. You were preachy. You're putting yourself on a pedestal and trying to be so much better than others. And I take the feedback because that's, a, that's another view. And maybe when I write my next book, I'll be conscious of that view and make sure that I come across, because that's not my intention, to preach or to pretend that I'm so much better, which I'm not. But the, the insight is profound. When we, we do a lot of things with our lives, they're all habits. They all learned behavior. I'm not born a racist. There's no way. I'm conditioned through the house I'm born into. It's like saying, you know, you speak the language of the house you're born into. You believe in the religion of the house you're born into. You, you have the political beliefs of the house you're born into. It's all learned behavior. So we get into adulthood and we're often regurgitating the beliefs of our society and our parents that we're born into. We haven't even formed our own opinions. So often, you know, there's that saying, 2% of people think, 3% think they think, and 95% would rather die than think. Because, because we actually, we don't really get down to thinking. But, but what, I, what I realized was everything's habits. So I, I start drinking because my adults around me drank alcohol every single day of their lives. And then weekends, big parties. The family had big parties. So from 16, I started having big parties. So it becomes a habit. And then I go and I realize, but hang on, I'm wasting about 40 hours a week with this habit. I want to stop this habit. And the best way of stopping a habit is replacing it with another habit. That's the best way. So I call the two habits, and I didn't call them good and bad habits because now I know that bad is actually good. So I call them limiting habits and liberating habits. So I'm not saying they're good or bad. I used to smoke for 18 years. Fantastic. I loved it. But it was a limiting habit. It was limiting my health. And I replaced it with a liberating habit. So, so it was just my approach to figure out life in my own way to have the best life I can have, to add the most value that I can, that I can add. So, so I just started replacing habits liberating limiting habits with liberating habits and i shared 20 of them in that book and and i sent the book out into the universe and i was hoping maybe it will add value to some people and 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 it certainly has it certainly has i mean the feedback um the feedback i'm seeing suggests that it has mm -hmm. um pepe in closing how do brands agencies as well as leaders translate as, and define, I suppose, their purpose or what they see to be their purpose to help grow both industries as well as the continent. Because you mentioned, of course, that you know you see purpose as as um, something that forms part of the fertile soil upon which everything else grows. How do we? How do leaders and agencies as well as brands define mm -hmm. that for themselves yeah. in order to help that growth happen? Yeah. So I'm on a journey. So I've been on this purpose journey for 15, 16 years now. I've just finished my master's. I'm doing my doctoral now on it. And I'm, I'm doing this intentionally to position myself as a thought leader in this field. Because, I mean, the power that I've seen that purpose can have in a medium-sized business of 300 people is profound. The power that I've seen that purpose can have in your personal life is spectacular. So I'm starting to dream of, imagine a country with a greater purpose. And can it help this country to become a shining example to the world? It's sure as hell is positioned. <laughs> you know, it's gone through so much trauma and it's still, it's still alive. So there's so much potential here. So I, I, I would say I'm very, 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 I'm, I'm way beyond most people on the subject of purpose in terms of the amount of reading I've done on it, the amount of learning I've done on it, the amount of living I've done on it. I'm, 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 I don't think there's many people that's, that's going to be as well positioned on the subject. And I want to say that so that whoever listens to it really 
takes it in that it's coming from someone who, who's got some serious clout on this matter. I mean, it is ingrained in my approach because I've seen the significant difference that it can make. So in essence, my experience of it is just like you have your human name, Mongesi. I've got mine, Pepe. Every single person has a human name that's given to them, mostly by their parents if they're privileged. Some, some people not, but mostly. Or their gogos or whoever gave that first name. But we are given a human name. But we are human beings. We're not just human. To me, the human is the, the more logic. The being is the magic. You know, the, 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 the head and the heart. The human and the being. It's fat, it is so powerful. So the being has a name. It, it fundamentally has a name, but most people are not aware of what is the name of their being. There's a, each of us have a spiritual being name that, that we're born into this world to be our reason for being. But we get preoccupied with doing, and we end up doing so much to try and make money, and we end up poor. But when we start becoming conscious that we should be living, doing both, being and doing. So not in the absence of doing. I'm a capitalist. I believe money is the root of all good. The more money I make, the better life I can give to my family, but the more value I can add to other people. So I drive a fancy car. I live in a beautiful house. But those are all byproducts of me defining my being. And then bringing that value to the world. So each person has this. It's just to take the time to start looking what is that one word at your core of your life. And then defining it. Because in the absence of definition, it's just an empty word. So the starting point is defining that one word. But then you have to figure out what it means. And then through my experience, I realized that exactly the same methodology applies to business. Businesses are given human names, NetBank, um, Chicken Licken, human name, Joe Public, human name, South African Breweries, human name. But what is the being name of that business? What, it, what is its greater reason for being? And if you can define it through one word and then define that word, and make that the strategy of the business, then I believe the business would add exponential value to its stakeholders, not just its shareholders, to all of its stakeholders. And because of that value, that exponential value, it will see an exponential expansion on the bottom line. It's all about the more you give, the more you get, if, as long as you don't give to get. But the world is obsessed with getting. Everyone is just in this world to see what can I get out of this relationship? What can I get? It's so self-serving. And it's making that step into the abyss of what can I give without getting anything back? And then see what happens. Yeah, yes, yes. That's a great point to close on, I think. I mean, what I'm getting out of that um, that purpose thing is that it's, firstly, it's a journey and a journey of finding and defining your essence if anything, and living up to to that essence. And um, Pepe, thank you very much. This was an insightful conversation. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, whoever listens to this will definitely find ways around, around defining their own purpose, around finding it, and around adding value to society as a result. Um, it was an absolute privilege and an honor to talk to you. Awesome, Mungesi. And thank you so much for your time and the opportunity. And as I always, I'm very conscious that when I get these opportunities, I, I keep on learning as well because you ask me questions that's not premeditated. So, yeah, thank you for the opportunity and your time. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Lead Creative. Did you get one insight that's worth sharing from this episode? Please share it with your network or your friends. Pop me some of your ideas and innovative finds on Twitter on at Mongesi. 
This podcast is available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also find me on mongezi.com.